cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. Wonderful thought, isn't it, to know that Jesus Christ has paid the entire debt for sin. He's infinite God, and so he made an infinite sacrifice for us. Marvelous truth of the gospel of Christ. Now, just a moment ago, we read that passage out of Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 through 15, in which God emphasizes his name. And the name that he gives to Moses at the burning bush here in Exodus chapter 3 is the name I Am. It's the foundational verbal root for the name Jehovah, or Yahweh in the Hebrew text. And so we've been looking at the various names of God that are built on the name I Am, or on the name Jehovah, translated in this passage with all capital letters L-O-R-D. The name Lord is the name Yahweh, or we say in English, Jehovah. And so we've been looking, interspersed with the missionary conference and uh, Mother's Day, we've spent three weeks looking at the fifth compound name of Jehovah in the Old Testament, which is the Lord my shepherd. Of course, you're all familiar with the passage from which that comes. It is Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And we've noted over those three weeks that there are at least 17 things that we are told about the Lord who is our shepherd and his character qualities here in the 23rd Psalm. He is personal and personally interested in us. We find a Psalm of David, the word I or me or my or mine 17 times in six verses. We know his name, Lord, that's Jehovah. He meets our actual needs, I shall not want. He enforces rest when we need it. He makes me to lie down. His rest is beneficial and beautiful in green pastures, not merely dry food to eat. He gives divine guidance. He leads me. His direction keeps us safe and provides refreshment beside the still waters. He helps us recover from damage when we have sustained the damage of life. He restoreth my soul. He always leads us into righteousness, the godly life. He leads me in paths of righteousness. He tells us his motive for doing so and for holy living. It's for his name's sake. He warns us of fearful times to come so that we will be prepared and gives us courage in the face of death. He himself is the solution to all of our human fears. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. He personally accompanies us through that dark valley of the shadow of death because he is the light of the world. He is omnipotent, and he protects us and disciplines us with his rod and with his staff. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And that's where we left off on May 5th. We learned that the rod that the shepherd uses is a stick for both punishment and also for discipline, but not for destruction. It was the term that God used of the rod that he himself would use on Solomon when God spoke to David and gave him the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Jesus confirms that principle of how God uses a rod on us, and this is new material, we did not mentioned this verse last time, but God uses the rod, and he did on Solomon, but he also uses it on us. Listen to Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt hath lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Do you remember what God told David would happen to Solomon? I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. Jesus reminds us that when we as the salt that is supposed to provide the taste of Christ to the world, when we lose our savor, what does he do? He lets us be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. God uses people, even pagans, to discipline those who are his children when they disobey. 
The rod we saw was divine, designed to emphatically teach the lessons of wisdom. We saw that the rod is what a good father uses to discipline his children. And there are dozens of verses on that, and we will not cover them again. But that is wisdom. And that's the way that a good father imparts wisdom to his children. The rod also speaks of leadership authority in the church in the hands of under shepherds and pastors who exercise the authority of the chief shepherd. And we saw that in 1 Corinthians 4 and in 1 Peter chapter 5. We saw that there are at least seven ways that the rod of discipline is a source of comfort. Remember David said, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The seven things, it proves that the shepherd loves us. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. It proves that the Lord loves us. It proves that we are his children. If you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. So when we get the discipline from our Heavenly Father, it's the proof that we are his children. It teaches us reverence for God, how important that is. We had fathers of the flesh and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much more give reverence unto the Father of spirits and live? Hebrews chapter 12. It proves that God is serious about our best good. He does it for our profit. <laughs> they did it at their own pleasure, but he for our profit. It proves that God is transforming us into his holiness. That's the way a father gives direction. So his children will learn to walk in ways of holiness. It produces the peaceable fruit of righteousness. And it is a source of spiritual exercise to make us strong in our faith. All seven of those are summarized in Hebrews chapter 12 for us as it describes the discipline of God who is our Heavenly Father, and as it explains the importance of the discipline that human fathers are to give their children if they would reflect their Heavenly Father. We saw that there's a different kind of rod. There's an iron rod that is used by God when he judges the earth. He shall smite the earth with a rod of iron out of his mouth, Isaiah 11:4, which is repeated again in three different places, three chapters in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 2, chapter 12, and chapter 19. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. He treads the fierceness, uh, the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. We saw that God used two words in that psalm to describe what was in the shepherd's hand. The first was the rod of discipline and defense. The second is... He says, thy rod and thy staff. And we saw that that word was Mishnah, a support or a walking stick. And so how that was related to the oral law of the Jews, the halakha, which Jesus condemned as the tradition of the Pharisees. Because the real support, the real walking stick in the hand of the shepherd is not the Mishnah. It is the word of God. And it should be the walking stick for us not the traditions of men. It was a sign and a seal of authority and rank, a badge of office. We saw it was used in the context of Gideon when the angel of the Lord stretched out his staff and performed a miracle. We saw that the staff was also a symbol of patriarchal authority and blessing when Isaac blessed Jacob and Jacob blessed those sons of Joseph worshiping and leaning on the top of his staff. So that brings us to verse 5 in Psalm 23 for today. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Have you ever puzzled over that first phrase in verse Five. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. When I was young, I used to think of that as a bunch of people sitting around a table in the palace of a great prince or a king or of a, a knight in shining armor, and then back there in the shadows somewhere there was an enemy lurking with a dagger. And yet the people are sitting around the table and enjoying their meal that has been provided for them. But that, of course, is not the context here of this psalm. It's the picture of 
sheep out there in a meadow by still waters eating and drinking and enjoying the fellowship in the presence of their shepherd. And yet it says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. God is reminding us that the enemy is there. He's reminding us that the enemy knows we are there in the presence of mine enemies. It's not like the enemy is unaware that we're there. The enemy can see us eating, but it cannot do anything about it because the shepherd is there too. Just imagine the following scene. Here are the sheep. They're out in the wilderness. Not far from the meadow where they are grazing, there is a hungry pack of wolves circling in the bushes. High on a cliff overlooking the meadow, there's a pair of mountain lions crouching, licking their lips as they gaze down on the sheep. Far above in the sky, there is an eagle circling around and around, looking for any lamb that would stray from the flock. A bear waits patiently at the edge of the clearing. A poisonous snake tries to slither through the grass. And just out of sight, around an outcropping of rock, a band of sheep thieves is peering, waiting for their moment of opportunity. The sheep graze peacefully and drink from the cool, still waters, unaware of how close the danger really is. The shepherd is the only thing that stands between them and certain destruction. Oh, there are some other under-shepherds who are not doing their jobs. They fall asleep. They spend time throwing rocks at each other. They dig in the dirt with their sticks. They spend some more time pawing through their knapsacks looking for something to eat. They scream and yell at each other. They flirt with the girls walking by and chat with travelers about the latest green-haired harp group to hit the music scene in Jerusalem. They sit under a tree and scribble on a piece of parchment about how much money they have saved and how much more they can make. Oh, they can make a whole lot more money. And in general, they ignore the needs of feeding the sheep. One of the little lambs bounces happily toward the bushes. The shepherd calls, but the lamb has a mind of its own and it does just what it pleases. The shepherd leaps up, he leaps out. Across the meadow, he gently taps the startled lamb on its side. The lamb bawls and runs back to its mother, crying out how mean the shepherd is. The shepherd smiles. On the far side of the rock, two rams have squared off over a particularly tasty patch of green grass. But it's near the dangerous outcropping of rock. And those two rams are going at it, banging their heads together. So... They like to bang heads. Okay. The shepherd gives them each a resounding whack on the head and the dazed rams stagger back to the flock. The lazy under-shepherds are amused and go back to their sloth and daydreaming. But there is one true shepherd. He never falls asleep. He watching over Israel, as the psalm says, slumbers not, nor sleeps. He never falls asleep. He is all-powerful. He is on guard all the time. He is the one that the enemies of the sheep fear. Night begins to fall. The sun goes down, the stars come out. The lazy under-shepherds yawn and call it a day and turn in for the night. The good shepherd peers into the growing gloom. The circle of predators tightens around the little camp. A wolf ventures into the clearing. The shepherd immediately leaps to his feet, rushes to the wolf, and res which responds with a snarl. The full force of the shepherd swings the rod down on the neck of the wolf, breaking its neck. 
The rest of the wolves shrink back. One of the environmentalist under-shepherds begins to complain about how we must be kind to animals because wolves may be an endangered species. The good shepherd lights a fire. The light penetrates the darkness around the camp, pushing the circle of wolves back. The sheep enter the thick thorn enclosure built by the good shepherd through only one opening. When all the sheep and lambs are inside, the shepherd himself sits in the doorway with his eyes penetrating the darkness. Anything that wants to get to the sheep has to come through him first. Remember what Jesus said Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief, that's the enemy cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is a hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. One of the most beautiful passages in the entire Gospel of John. The Lord is my shepherd. And he laid down his life for me. Can you say that? Do you know it for sure? Young people and children especially listen carefully. Remember the little lamb bouncing around in the field? The Bible says that your enemy, the devil, is like a roaring lion looking for ways to kill you and eat you. He's always looking for the weak sheep. He's always looking for disobedient lambs. Remember that eagle that was circling above, waiting for a lamb to stray from the flock? Listen to what Proverbs says, verse 17 of chapter 30. The eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother. The ravens of the valley shall pick it out. The young eagles shall eat it. Be very careful if you decide you want to rebel against your father and mother. You're just a little lamb. There are wolves. There are bears. There are mountain lions. There are serpents. There are eagles. They're waiting to catch you. Remember, thou preparest a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. That's important for all of us. The enemy is deceptive, especially using false teachers, but they are like a pack of wolves, and wolves have no conscience. Jesus said in Matthew 7.15, Beware of false prophets which come unto you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. 
There are those who pretend to be among the sheep. They pretend to lead the sheep, but they're leading them into a trap. They're leading them into the waiting pack of wolves. They have no conscience. Inwardly, they are ravening wolves. Under shepherds, those who are pastors and elders are warned that the job is a difficult and dangerous job to do in caring for sheep. Matthew 10, verse 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. They're, the under shepherds are part of the group of sheep. They're leaders among the sheep. But Jesus, as he speaks to the disciples, says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Luke 10.3, Go your ways, behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Those are little sheep. Not much chance to stand against a wolf. You see, all of us, including the pastor, including the elders of this church, have to depend on the chief shepherd, the one who neither slumbers nor sleeps. The one who is always there to protect and defend. The Old Testament prophets warned, smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Of course, that's what happened with Christ on the cross. That's what happens, too, when the devil manages to knock down a man who is a pastor or an elder. He knows how to destroy the flock. Dear friends, we are surrounded by enemies. The only one you can trust is the good shepherd. Faithful under-shepherds will warn their flock what will happen when God calls them home or calls them to other service. The Apostle Paul, speaking to the Ephesian elders, these are men who are mature in their faith. In fact, as you read the book of Ephesians, you recognize that was a church where a great amount of doctrinal truth had been given. Where the practice of the Christian life was well understood. Three chapters given to doctrinal truth, three chapters given to practical Christian living. First three are solid doctrine. Last three, practical living. Here's what Paul, speaking to the Ephesian elders, said. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. He was warning them that he was on his way to his heavenly home. He was going to go to Rome and eventually he was going to be killed. He said to them, be warned, grievous wolves are going to enter in, not sparing the flock. And then he gave them a further warning, some are going to among you rise up and try to split the flock. The flock belongs to the chief shepherd. Remember that when you're tempted to be a wolf. Remember that when you're tempted to be a disobedient sheep. Remember that when you're tempted to be a wolf in sheep's clothing. Remember that when you're tempted to split the flock. Someday we shall all stand before the chief shepherd and all of us who have trusted Christ are among the sheep, even those who are in positions of leadership. Let it be a reminder to us of how our shepherd feeds us. This wonderful phrase, thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. The good shepherd prepares a feast for you from his word. That's the only place that you have your table prepared. That is the food and the drink that he gives to you. But remember, he prepares it for you in the presence of your enemies. If you wander away from his word, you walk straight into the pack of wolves. You walk straight into the mouths of the hungry lions, the hungry bears, the eagles that circle the valley. Your word, the word of God is what you have that God prepares for you. 
And as you gather here, as you hear the word of God, as you rise in the morning and seek God's face in your private quiet time, as perhaps you stop on your lunch break and pull out your New Testament to read a portion of scripture, God has prepared for you there a feast. It is never just a hamburger meal. Every time you open his word, he has spread a banquet table before you. But remember, it is in the presence of your enemies. They know you're there. They see the feast that has been provided for you. Oh, how they desire to take that feast away from you. If they can, like the totalitarian dictatorships of this world, they will remove it from you entirely. They will burn it. It goes all the way back to the days of ancient Rome. They don't want you to be fed by the shepherd. The scripture is always portrayed as the food for the believer. All the way back to Job, the oldest book of the Bible Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Jeremiah the weeping prophet, chapter 15, verse 16. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. That's Yahweh Sabaoth the Lord of armies, the Lord of hosts. I'm called by thy name. Remember Jesus said, he knows his sheep and he calls them by name. Are you one of his sheep? Do you know it for sure? Or do you merely go to church and act good? And when you're out of sight, you do your own thing. I beg you, search your heart. Has he called you by name? The good shepherd calls his sheep by name and they follow him. If you're not following him, perhaps he has not yet called you by name. Dear friends, trust Christ. He is the only one who can protect you from the enemy that surrounds you. He calls his own by name and leads them out. First Peter chapter 2 explains to us how the word of God is our food and we, we have a growth period in our lives where we start with one kind of food and we end up with a different kind of food as we grow. 1 Peter 2.2, 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Now we've had 13 kids and now we've got I don't know how many grandkids and a bunch more on the way. Very excited about that. But you know something? Not one of them was born, popped open his eyes and said, give me a steak. Not one of them. <laughs> what do they want? They want their mother's milk. As newborn babes desire, earnestly yearn for the sincere milk of the word. That you may grow thereby. You will not grow in your Christian life unless you take the milk of God's word as he has offered it to you. There are simple things in the word of God that you will understand immediately. And as you begin to have an intake of those things, God will cause spiritual growth in your life until you are ready for the more difficult things in the word. Hear it in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 2. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, Neither yet now are ye able. A mother does not force the baby to chew on beefsteak, even though beefsteak is wonderful, very nourishing, one of my favorite things in the whole world. But when I was born, my mother did not take a half pound 
you know, T-bone steak and try to shove it down my throat. She just didn't do it. I wouldn't be here today if she did. You have to start. When you lead someone to Christ with the simple things, too often we, in the Reformation tradition, want to immediately hit them with all kinds of big, heavy doctrines. Dear friends, the way to cause growth is you start with the milk of the word. And as they grow, you can begin to feed them meat. The Corinthians had been around for a while. And Paul says, you know, I keep having to feed you with milk. You know, you should be able to take meat now, but, but you have atrophied in your faith instead of growing. Oh, read all of that chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it explains it. Book of Hebrews talks about that too. It talks about the atrophy that come when you do not take the word of God as your food. Paul writes in chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, For when for the time you ought to be teachers, in other words, you have been saved long enough that you shouldn't just be whining and crying like a bunch of babies. When for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles, that's the bottom line basics, of the oracles of God. Now listen to his next phrase and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. What is the table that the shepherd prepares for us in the presence of his enemies? The table where the food is laid out for us is the word of God. Everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. If you don't know how to apply the scripture, where it controls all of your actions, thoughts, and speech during the week, it may be an indication that you have not gotten past the milk stage. Verse 14, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who, now listen to this next phrase, by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Reason of use. Use of what? Use of the word of righteousness. That's his subject. That's the strong meat that has been used on a daily basis so that you can tell the difference between good and evil because Satan is a deceiver and he always presents his poison in tasty garb. He tries to slip it up on the table. He slips it up through television. He slips it up through movies. He slips it up through the magazines and the checkout stand as you're going through the, the grocery line. He slips it up there by things that you hear at work. He slips it up there by some radio commentator that you've heard out there. He slips it up to you on the table through another Christian. When you have a constant intake of the word of God, you are having your senses exercised so that you know the taste, so that you can discern between good and evil. You begin to put it in your mouth, you sniff, you taste it, and you say, wait a minute, there is something wrong with this. This doesn't taste like the food that the shepherd has given me in the source that I can trust. Who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. He prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. He anoints our head with oil. Our cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We'll have to come back to some of that, but I just want to point out that last phrase. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. You see, the shepherd has a purpose. As he feeds us, as he causes us to grow, he's in the process of preparing a place for us to live in. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for this beautiful psalm. It reminds us of what a truly good shepherd we have. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who lays down his life for the sheep. The one who prepares a a table for us in the presence of our enemies. The one who anoints our head with oil. The one who makes sure that our cup runs over. Father, how we thank you for him who shows us goodness and mercy all the days of our life. The one who even now is preparing a place for us and if he goes and prepares a place for us, we have this absolute confidence that he will come again and receive us unto himself that where he is, there we may be also. And we know the way, for he said two verses later, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Father, only you can see the hearts of these, your people here. You know which ones are your sheep. You know which ones are saved. You know which ones are lost and on their way to hell. Everybody looks the same on the outside. We've all showed up for a service today. But you know the heart. There might be someone here who is very young today, who has never really trusted Jesus. Might be someone who is middle-aged, and they're bright and sharp and working in this world and making a go at it. But they're running toward the end of a cliff. There might be an older person here or listening over this broadcast who thinks they've been good. And they're just sort of relaxing and sliding along and watching the world go by. not knowing that they'll be dragged to the pit of hell. Father, you alone know the heart. You alone can convict the heart of sin. If we find ourselves arguing with whether or not we're sinners at this point, it's a good indication that we're probably lost. And as you convict of sin... You alone can take your word and draw that unsaved person to Christ. Oh, Father, sometimes it takes a very hard knock from the staff and the rod of the shepherd. Sometimes it takes a gentle tap. Father, I pray that if there is someone here today who has not trusted Christ alone for salvation that this would be the moment that he or she believes on the Lord Jesus Christ and is saved and enters from darkness to light, is rescued from the pack of wolves surrounding the flock, is brought safe inside the hedge where the shepherd himself sits as the door. We praise you for your word, Father. Take it and use it as you have designed it and as you please. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 6.